Thank you, Sally. That was really wonderful. And thank you, everyone who's here tonight. This is such a joyous occasion for us in the program. And we're so pleased to have you all here to celebrate with us. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Janine Savard. Professor Janine Savard, a native of the Adirondacks, came to the desert in the 1980s to be a member of the writing community that we're celebrating tonight. She's the author of multiple volumes of poetry, Trumpeter, Snowwater Cove, and My Hand Upon Your Name, and is published in numerous national magazines and journals, including Hayden's Fairy Review and the Superstition Review, founded by MFA program graduates and an alumna, respectively. But these accomplishments alone do not capture who Janine is as an artist and as a teacher. If I had to describe Janine in one word, there's an obvious choice for me, and that is honest. Janine is beautifully honest as a writer and as a teacher. If your work is weak, if it is struggling, if it could be in any way better, Janine will tell you. <laughs> and then she'll devote all of herself, her time, her energy, and her myriad of skills to help you improve. I'm not a poet, but Janine welcomed me into her class, supported me and nurtured me throughout it, and that's an experience that I will always be grateful for. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Janine Savard. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you all for being here. Of all the time that I've spent here at ASU, I have to say, finally, it, it, it has been a privilege for me to teach. And uh, even though, yeah, I am, um, you know, that, it's funny about the honesty part. I, I do, I, <laughs> I do, but there's a price to pay for that. Let me say that. <laughs> oh, oh, I need my glasses. Just one moment. I'll be reading uh, five poems this evening, and some of them will require some introduction, brief, briefly. And uh, the first poem is, uh, was written this summer, uh, midsummer uh, 2015, uh, with the two planets um, coming into conjunction. So all you really need to know about this poem is that there are two people, there are two planets, and something happens in between. All right, Midsummer, 2015. We had been out watching Venus and Jupiter collide, a trick of the street light intercepting our eyes when we heard the displaced sounds of a boat rubbing against some tires bound to a dock and to a glass bowl singing inside someone's ear held to the cold. We looked around the corner, up and down the street, and saw nothing. Our faces appeared lacquered, though no liquor was involved. We asked ourselves, are we the only ones to call ourselves witness? Was it all inside our very own fierceness? What other hidden stock, adrift and shining, might scuff and serenade under? All of the windows had their shades pulled. Nothing here but our minds, electric in recognition for the twin interpretation and the disruption of a kiss under the long anticipated, since the time of Christ, planetary conjunction. Uh, the next poem is a sonnet. Um, I chose this poem simply because I like it. Uh, no other reason. The one day I wore my mother's gold cross without permission, I lost it. I blame the clasp, faulty, old, imperfect, an excuse smart but deficit, since I knew she had kept it safe for 30 years inside a porcelain shoe. I learned she found it in a church pew under the pleats of her skirt, a shape she followed with her fingers from the Angelus to her filing out to the street into the open air where she'd examine it better, anomalous black jewel at the center, lit up as if from heaven. In the end, my mother said it was a huge relief. She had thought herself too long, a bad little thief. I like to think of my mother now because she was so perfect in, in so many ways. That, Okay, uh, 
The next poem I uh, selected was written in memory of one of my former students who, um, who died suddenly, he was very young, died of a heart attack. And um, the filmmaker mentioned in the poem is uh, Akira, Akira Kurosawa, and his name, uh, Kiro, means to live. Some afterwards for Tim. Someone opened the discussion with, we live and then we die. Then you, Tim, reminded them about the chance for an afterward. All they had to do was write, you said, live and write. Do it for yourself and for those who can't. Most winter days, you wore a natty gray cardigan over a black cotton tee, fit the description of M's last persona, tough guy in the guise of a grandfather waking from his nap. In spring, green vines and samurai tattoos crawled out of your shortened sleeves. You said in conference, just looking at these gives me strength. Remembering that and how I fought with your conviction, you'd never get old. I was afraid, watching you walk backwards, waving, your head and shoulders filled with the faint chimes carried over from the chapel, and in the corridor, skies, glassy, cinnamon light. Remember Dee, who admitted in class she lost her faith in men? She has now confided to us, not long after your heart attacked, after you didn't make it back, that you had offered her once your gloves it was a cold night in January, both of you in line, waiting for the concert doors to open. She confessed your kindness was real, but she was stuck, couldn't get back the trust. Still, she reminds herself, live and write. On my way home yesterday, under crimps of tussock grass, an unexpected rabbit stood up, gray coat, glossed muscles, flexed. I called him Ikiru for you to live continuously. I wrote what you might have said with the voice of your favorite filmmaker. There's allowances for desires, even the longing for distances ahead and for any number of incisive jump cuts along the way. All of you live on. That's one of the hard parts about teaching when um, <laughs> When you can, uh, when you, when you get into the lives of students, and some of them have difficult times, or some of them don't make it, it's really hard to experience that. But um, I think Tim gave good advice: uh, live as long as you can and write. Um, the next poem is an abecedarius, which is um, a poem where the first letter of every line follows the alphabet all the way through. Uh, this is one of the poems I wrote on my sabbatical when I was in India. And of course, I got the flu while I was there. So uh, this poem is sort of a record of that. Once in Asia, the infinitely near. At the foot of the bed, Bits of light like oval cut diamonds collected on my toes. After an updraft, dusted the mirror with a rough expression. The face turned for more and more faces, common features but unknown. Ginger lilies trimmed the window where Himalayan mountain peaks closed in, intensifying the guest room's perfection. Jigme, one of the monastery dogs, stood beside the door as if Carillion slides, blue and violet, had caught him in one long pause of watchfulness, some hidden master or deity having given him the order not to bark nor disturb in any way the feverish, flu-struck woman. Opalescent lockets replacing the faces rotated, then pressed into each other, becoming one. I wanted to remember quotations to sustain me, but the diamonds fell, and I relinquished all I once considered exclusively mine. Stubbornness slipped into stranded, soon tumbled into nothing out of the lungs. Unimagined joy filled every lost bone. My friend, back from visiting the local monks, recounted his encounter with space and time, whirling around a prayer wheel, 
Who was it there cleared the pneumonia over here? X and Y, chromosomal strips of breath climb between us in the coal room. Yolk symbols with embossed fish slip free of their silk pocket. Zero thoughts arrived, escaped the same way. A bit hallucinatory, I would say. Um, the uh, last poem, you might recognize that the, it takes place at the uh, Salt River and um, it involves, um, there's a mention of um, a Greek goddess who was one of the, o the oldest fate, um, Atropo, and she was the one who would cut the uh, thread of life. Desert transits. I'm standing not two miles from the runways, not more than a few yards from the amber bottle's wall of art, a foot from where I stood inside the last century, its river rock bottom, not a boat's landing or inland marsh then, not the heron picking its way through reeds, one leg after another, slender stick out of the fiddlesticks waiting in the reflected neck curls of clouds away from the siege, the freeway, whoosh. While looking into the water's depth, I found my younger self, my 20-year-old, who had fallen between two boulders and cracked her head, her breath, a web nearly fully cut by atropo. Mimosa pollen spread like a bomb across the throat. There are no more years between. We clearly hear the regenerative breaking, followed by the shoo through our city streets, our accelerated silver and green light rail. Before leaving this time, we'd like to bow to everything, everyone. That's it.